Okay, welcome to General Psychology, week number four. Uh, today we're talking about states of consciousness. We're not going to finish it today. It is a long uh, uh, lecture, at least a long PowerPoint, so we'll get through about half of it today. Okay, it includes, you know, talking about sleeping, waking, it includes talking about drugs. We won't get to drugs today. Um, I guess I don't have an overview for this PowerPoint, so we'll just start right off just by talking about consciousness. What is consciousness? What does it mean to be conscious? Consciousness means that you are aware of internal and external stimuli. It basically means you're aware of things. You're aware of things going on inside you, and you are aware of things going on around you, outside of you. So internal stimuli, things going on inside you could include, you know, a feeling of pain, maybe if you have a headache or you have some kind of injury, maybe you're hungry, maybe aware of certain thoughts, you know, aware maybe of the fact that, you know, you have to, uh, you know, go to the grocery store or something like that, or you have a doctor appointment, maybe you are aware of those thoughts, aware of certain emotions that you may be feeling, maybe bored or sad or whatever it is. You're aware of stuff inside you. And you're also aware of stuff that's outside of you, okay? To be conscious means you're also aware of what's happening around you. Maybe you're aware of the light from the sun, right? Feeling of warmth in the room. Or, uh, you know, you're, uh, you can hear the sounds around you, but... Uh, that's what consciousness means. You know what's happening. You're conscious, right? You know what's happening. You're aware of what's happening inside you and things that are happening outside. That's what consciousness means. Okay, let's keep going. Now, what does it mean to be awake? And what does it mean to be asleep? It's not exactly the same as being conscious, okay? Uh, to be awake means that um, you are highly aware, okay? Wakefulness is characterized by high levels of sensory awareness, high levels of thought and behavior. To be awake, awake means basically that, uh, you know, that you're aware of things. You can hear and see things, you know, you're, um, you know, you're aware of what's happening. Okay, so similar to conscious there, but there's high levels of sensory awareness. So you are very aware of what's happening around you, very aware of those sounds. You know, those, uh, the things that you're seeing, all those different things, smells, whatever it is. And there's also high levels of thoughts. When we're awake, we're usually thinking about a lot of things, things we have to do, things we want to do, uh, whatever it is. There's high levels of thoughts and high levels of behavior. We're not always doing a lot of things, but, you know, we go to the bathroom, you know, we eat, uh, you know, we walk around, we get in our cars, we drive places. That's what it means to be awake. There's high levels of thought, high levels of behavior, and high levels of sensory awareness. And by sensory awareness, we're talking about your five senses, right? You see, you hear, you taste, you touch, smell, you feel, right? Um, there's high levels of that. That's what it means to be awake. Now, when you are asleep, that's different. Sleep is marked by relatively low levels of physical activity, reduced sensory awareness, okay? Uh, so when you're asleep, there's lower levels of physical activity. When you're asleep, you're not walking around anywhere, okay? You're not eating anything. You're not going to the bathroom, right? Hopefully you're not peeing yourself or anything like that while you're asleep. But, um, you know, there's low levels of physical activity. Reduce sensory awareness. When you're asleep, uh, do you really hear things? Do you really smell things? There is, you probably are still are hearing things, maybe smelling things. Your eyes are closed, so you're not really seeing anything. Um, but it's a at a very low level. Your brain is still kind of... Uh, you know, detecting things, but you're not really responding to them. So there's reduced levels of sens sensory awareness. It would take a louder sound, for instance, to wake you up, not just somebody talking. It depends on the sleep stage that you're at. Uh, and it doesn't say this, but uh, just to make it, uh, you know, similar to wakefulness, there would be low levels of thought when you're asleep, assuming you're not dreaming, but they're usually lower levels of thought. Okay. Um, it depends on which stage of sleep you're at, and we'll talk about that. So wakefulness means there's a lot of stuff happening, okay? You're aware of things, you're thinking about a lot of things, uh, and you're doing a lot of things. Sleep is the opposite, usually. It means there's low levels of awareness, reduce uh, levels of thought, uh, reduce uh, physical activity. Now, there's also stuff that's kind of in between. There's between sleep and consciousness, okay? So sometimes you're in between. Maybe you're daydreaming. You know, like when we normally have class and you're sitting there and it's boring and you're kind of daydreaming, just thinking about, you know, when you're going to get home and, you know, and you're going to like uh, start playing video games. Or maybe you're daydreaming about being at the beach or daydreaming about some person you like, right? 
you're not really all there, okay? That's what that means. You're somewhere in between. You're not asleep. You're not fully awake either. You're daydreaming. Or you're intoxicated, right? You're high on weed or alcohol. And also, you are not fully there. You are not fully awake. You're not asleep, but you're not fully there either. You're intoxicated. When you're meditating as well, you know, when you meditate, uh, meditation is a, a state of deep relaxation. So uh, you're not completely awake, right? You're not completely aware of what's happening around you. You're also not asleep. You're somewhere in between in a relaxed state, okay? So that's what it means to be between uh, sleep and wakefulness. Now, you can also have what's called altered consciousness, in which the quality or the pattern of mental activity is different. When you have altered consciousness, that means that things aren't really the way they seem. So maybe you are sleep deprived, okay? Or you're under the influence of drugs and you think you see things that aren't there. You think you hear things that aren't there, okay? You might even think you feel things. You're under certain, the influence of certain drugs and you think there's bugs crawling on your, on your arm or something and there's nothing like that happening. So consciousness has been altered because you're under the influence of drugs. You, you're all, your consciousness can also be altered if you're sleep deprived. When you're sleep deprived, very sleepy, very tired, right? And you're trying to go about your day, uh, you may actually think that you see things that aren't there or hear things that aren't there. And it might be just your mind, right? Uh, sending you those messages because your, uh, your consciousness is altered, okay? You're not, well, you're not fully aware of everything. And sometimes you, you, things that may be in your head may seem like they're actually happening in real life. Consciousness has been altered, okay? That's to do with, uh, you know, being in, be also, you know, it has to do with dreaming and stuff like that and how thoughts can actually in intrude into waking life. But that's going beyond what we need to talk about. Now, there's also unconscious. Unconscious means that basically there's no awareness of what's happening. You're not aware of what things are happening inside you. You're not aware of things happening outside of you. You are out, basically. You're not dead. To be dead means different, is, is different, okay? And by the way, it's not so easy to define what it means to be dead but something to do with being brain dead and things like that. But um, uh, unconscious just means you're not aware of what's happening around you. You can still be breathing, okay? And you know, like I said, you're not dead. But um, if you're, let's say, under drug-induced uh, anesthesia, right? They, you know, they give you anesthesia so you can have some medical procedure, right? Have surgery. Um, they give you that, they knock you out. You know, basically you're unconscious. You won't feel them cutting into you or doing whatever they're doing. You won't hear them, you won't see them. Uh, there'll be no consciousness whatsoever in that case. You're unconscious. It depends on the level of consciousness, but if you're unconscious, truly unconscious, you're not aware of anything. And then later on, they kind of uh, you know, bring you out of that unconscious state, they do something else, or maybe it wears off the drug, and you wake up. You weren't really asleep, you were unconscious, but you wake up and, uh, and now you are aware of what's happening around you. And that time that you were under surgery, it could have been hours or maybe even days if it's really complicated. But for you, it will seem like it's one minute to the next. One minute you were awake and conscious. And then you're uh, conscious again, but you're not aware of the passage of time. That's what it means to be unconscious. I know that's happened to me. When I was a kid, I got run over by a car. You know, it didn't kill me, but I got hit by a car, knocked unconscious, woke up in the hospital, it just seemed like it was one minute to the next. I had no idea what happened in between or anything. No idea. It didn't feel like an hour or anything like that. It could have been hours later. It could have been, you know, minutes. It could have been days. I don't really know. I guess I should ask my mom, you know. Uh, but I was completely unconscious. Let's keep going. Let's talk about related things, uh, biological rhythms. A biological rhythm is basically something that happens in a predictable pattern. So they are internal rhythms. When ha something happens in a rhythm, that means it happens in a predictable way. Like, for instance, the menstrual cycle is a biological rhythm. It's something that happens about every 28 days, uh, women of a certain age get their period. Okay? And it's, it's a biological rhythm. It's something that happens in a predictable way. Now, I know there's some women who are irregular and they don't get it every 28 days. And there are some that don't get a period much at all because they're on birth control. Um, but normally it happens every 28 days, although some people can be irregular, but that's a biological rhythm. That's something that happens in a predictable way at predictable time intervals. 
Temperature is also a biological rhythm. It usually fluctuates over 24, a 24 hour period. It goes up and down, believe it or not. It varies by a few degrees. Uh, and so does alertness. Alertness also varies in a predictable way. It's a biological rhythm. Higher levels of, assert, uh, of, of alertness are associated with higher body temperature, okay? Sleepiness is associated with uh, lower body temperatures. Uh, and you can see a, um, a uh, graph over here and you can see how body temperature varies throughout the day. You know, so this person, you know, probably went to sleep late, so 12 a.m. So, uh, you know, they probably went to bed maybe like 11 or something like that, or I don't know, maybe 11.30, depending how long it takes them to fall asleep. But they go to sleep, they fall asleep, okay? And then when they fall asleep, the body cools down and the temperature goes down from close to 99 to about 97 and a half. It goes down, it's about at its lowest point at about maybe four, 5 a.m. And then after that, the body needs, uh, starts to warm up a little bit. Starts to warm up and they wake up. And then when they wake up, they go throughout their day, body temperature rises a little bit throughout the day. And then they go to sleep again and it falls again. The body cools down when you sleep. And that's a, a key for to helping you sleep, right? If you're having trouble sleeping, there's many things that can help. But one thing that helps is cooling down the body, right? It's very hard to fall, it's very hard to fall asleep if your body is hot, right? If you, let's say, uh, don't have AC and it's hot, or you don't have the AC at a, at a low enough temperature, you know, you should have it in the 70s, okay? Not in the 80s, that's too warm for falling asleep. 80s might be okay for walking around, right? But not for sleeping, okay? It'll take you longer to fall asleep. So maybe taking a shower, a cool shower, will help you fall asleep, it'll help cool down the body. And then you, uh, you, know, you lay down and your body uh, cools down more quickly, it helps you fall asleep. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about something now uh, called uh, circadian rhythms. A circadian rhythm, uh, what they are is that they uh, are biological rhythms, okay, that take place over a 24 hour period. So a circadian rhythm is just a special kind of biological rhythm. A circadian rhythm is basically something that varies over 24 hours, something about the body. And there's a lot of things, okay. We'll talk about our sleep-wake cycle. It varies over 24 hours. Okay, we'll spend a lot of time on that. We'll spend a lot of time talking about sleep. We're gonna talk mostly about sleep today. But other things that vary over a 24-hour period is your heart rate, right? Your heart rate goes up and down. It slows down when you sleep, okay? It, it, you know, your blood pressure varies as well, your blood sugar levels, your body temperature that we already talked about, and also alertness. Body temperature, alertness, heart rate, all those things you know, vary over a 24 hour period. And they're all related. All these things are related. There's a reason why they vary over a 24 hour period. They have to do with basically being active or not very active, you know, being awake or asleep, okay? So there are things that vary over a 24 hour period. And there's other things, you know, uh, like your appetite varies over a 24 hour period. There's sometimes when you're basically hungry and sometimes when you're not hungry. We tend to get hungry around the same times of the day. And also when we go to the bathroom, we tend to go to the bathroom at predictable times after so many hours. Sometimes we need to go and sometimes we don't need to go. Um, lots of things vary over a 24 hour period. If they vary a long, over a longer period of time, like over days or weeks or months, then that's not a circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythms vary over 24 hours. That means they happen predictably in 24 hours, within 24 hours. Uh, here's a figure for you guys because we're going to start talking about sleep. Actually, there's information there also, not just, a, not just an image. Um, so you need to know about something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, abbreviated SCN. The suprachiasmatic nucleus shows you where it is right there. It's that little, well, it's kind of right there in the middle where it's, you can, it's pointing at, it's labeled, okay? Um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is basically uh, our internal clock. Our brain seems to have a type of clock, but it's not like a regular clock with digits or with little uh, hands that tell you the time. It's a different kind of clock, but the brain needs to know when it's daytime or nighttime. So it has this internal clock called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's the brain's clock mechanism. Um, and it sets itself with light that it receives from the retina. So what happens is basically if it's daytime, light enters your eyes, and basically stimulates 
you know, neurons in the eye. And then those, some of those send signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus telling you, hey, it's daytime, time for you to be awake, right? Time for you to be active. And another signals, of course, go to the back of the brain for vision, okay? But some of those signals go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it basically uses light. It sounds kind of really uh, nonsensical, right? It uses light to know if it's daytime, okay? But that's how our body knows. So here's the thing though, the clock can be off, okay? And we'll talk about that. But you need normal day and night patterns for your clock to be running appropriately. If the clock is running well, that means during the daytime you're awake because we are di or no, right? We're awake and active during the day. And then we get sleepy during the night. That's if your clock is working um, properly. But of course, if, uh, if you are sleepy during the day and wide awake at night, that means there's something wrong with your internal clock and you need to reset it. And we'll talk about how to do that. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is your master clock. It tells you whether it's daytime or nighttime. What it does is it communicates with the pineal gland. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how to behave. It just tells you whether it's day or night. What, that's what the suprachiasmatic nucleus does. But it communicates with the pineal gland and the pineal gland will then release epinephrine during the daytime, and that makes you more alert. Epinephrine, remember, is the same thing as adrenaline, okay? So more adrenaline during the day, so you can be more active, more alert, okay? The suprachiasmatic nucleus doesn't make you more alert. It communicates with the pineal gland, and then the pineal gland can release epinephrine to make you more alert. During the night, if the suprachiasmatic nucleus tells the pineal gland, hey, it's nighttime, right? then the pineal gland will release melatonin, which makes you sleepy and makes you less active, less alert. Um, there's environmental cues, particularly light, uh, that basically synchronize our clock with the outside world, right? So we need to be awake and active, most of us, right? Uh, when it's daytime, we're diurnal. We are physically built to be active during the day. So during the day, our Supercharismatic nucleus, our internal clock needs to tell us it's daytime, you need to be active and alert. Okay? And during the night, it tells us it's nighttime, time for you to basically be less active and go to sleep. And if it's working properly, right, based on light, then your body is in synchrony with the outside world, right? You're active during the day and you're sleepy at night. Sometimes people's clock can be off though, there can be problems where people are sleepy during the day and wide awake at night, their clock is reversed. The way to fix that is with light. The way to fix that is with, uh, well, devices like this. You don't need a device like this, but this is just a bright light is all that is. What needs to happen, see, in order for your clock to work properly, what you need to do to reset it if the clock is not working properly, if it's, if it's telling you it's daytime at night and therefore you're wide awake at night and, it's, and you're sleepy during the day, in order to reset the clock, all you need to do is expose yourself to bright light. So if it's daytime, you need to be exposed to bright light. And you don't need a bright light like this, right? You can just go outside. And as long as you live in a place that's sunny, that should be enough. You go outside and you expose yourself to, to light when you, you know, dur during the day. And then you get exposed to nighttime, right? You get exposed to darkness during the night. Several days of being exposed to normal day and night will reset your clock and it'll start working properly. Um, you don't need a, a light like this unless during the day, let's say you're working and your clock is messed up and you're sleepy during the day. Uh, well, then your work needs to basically provide bright light. They need to have an, enough lighting so that your suprachiasmatic nucleus says it's daytime. You need to be alert. So, but you know, your clock can be off. It can be disrupted. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one thing you can do to reset your clock is basically an easy way to do that. Or it's not, I wouldn't say necessarily easy, but uh, without anything fancy is go ahead and go camping. Sleep in a tent. You'll see that during the day, you can't sleep. It is so bright. You know, even if you're inside the tent, it's just so bright that you wake up when the sun comes up. You just have to. It's just, there's too much light. And then you're there, you're active during the day, do your stuff. And then the sun sets, the sun goes down and it gets very dark when you're away from the city. And you have no choice but to crawl into that tent and sleep. Do that for several days, do that for a week and your clock will work properly, okay? 
but yeah, there can, your clock can be off and it can be making you sleepy during the day and, and be wide awake at night. So we've been talking about this already, but there, yeah, there are disruptions in normal sleep. Why might your clock be off? Why might be uh, basically, uh, it's not synchronized with the outside world. Why, why might your clock be off? Well, one reason might be jet lag. It's a disruption of sleep when you travel, right? So let's say you travel, you go to New York or something like that, and it's like three hours later over there. So there you are trying to go to sleep and, uh, and you know, at, at, let's say at uh, nine o'clock, uh, but uh, you can't, you know, because your body, for your body, it feels like it's six o'clock because your body is used to a different time. So you can't fall asleep. And then, then uh, you know, and well, that, that's gonna cause problems, okay? So to make it simple, it's jet lag is just basically when you fly to a different place and it's a different time and your body has to readjust to the new time. And when your body has to readjust or when it hasn't adjusted there, you will feel fatigued, you'll feel tired because you couldn't sleep at night, okay? And now you have to be awake and you didn't get very good sleep because your body's not used to it. You'll feel sluggish, irritable, you know, grouchy. You'll have insomnia, you won't be able to sleep because your body's used to a different time. That is jet lag, okay? It takes a while several days, you know, for you to get used to the new time. And then jet lag will go away. Uh, shift work can also cause problems, uh, you know, with, uh, with sleep. It can also disrupt your normal cycle. It can throw off your, uh, your uh, internal clock, okay? Your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Shift work is when you work uh, during late hours of the night. When you do shift work or you work the graveyard shift, what that means is that instead of being asleep at night, you have to go to work and you go to work and you try to stay awake and you're not as productive as you could be because it's nighttime and your body's telling you you should be asleep. And then work ends and it's daytime now and now you go home and now you need to try to get some sleep but you can't because it's bright, it's daytime. And what happens is you'll probably only get a few hours of sleep and your body won't be able to sleep that well. So you'll have sleep problems, you won't be as productive, you won't be as alert, you might even develop depression, anxiety, uh, because you know your normal sleep pattern, your normal day wake you know, sleep and wake pattern has been disrupted. But people do get used to it over time. They you know they do get used to working at night and uh, sleeping during the day. But it's hard to do that. But if you want to be productive at night, you need very bright light to trick your body into thinking that it's daytime. And then during the day, when you go back and you want to try to get some sleep. You need to get yourself into a very dark room, heavy curtains, dark room, right? No light, and then you'll be able to sleep. But even then, you will not get your normal hours of sleep. It's, sleep will be disrupted, and you won't be as productive as you, as you could have been. I had an uncle who used to do that. He used to work the graveyard shift, you know. Uh, there's work that needs to be done at night, you know. That's, at night is when, uh, when, you know, if you live in a city, that's when they clean the streets. The street sweeper comes out, and they clean the streets. You know, people clean things, people, uh, people do things to make sure that, the, that things are ready to go for the, in the daytime. There's people who are baking and cooking and, and you know, or, or doing things like if they work at a resort, you know, they do things during the night to make sure that everything is clean and ready and everything's baked and the food is ready for those that come in, you know, for the breakfast buffet or whatever it is. There's people who have to get up early or wake or, 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 um, or work at night in order uh, to do this. Well, the way my uncle dealt with it is he worked at night and he did his work. I went with him for a week once. It was hard to be awake at night. Um, he would work during the night. And then during the day, he didn't really get much sleep. During the day, he would always be drunk. I guess some alcohol would help uh, relax you, you know, and maybe even help you sleep a little bit. But um, that's what he did. He was an alcoholic, right? Uh, working during the night and, and basically had a 40 ounce in his hand during the day, uh, you know, every day. He was always drinking. He's an alcoholic, okay? That's the way he coped, I guess, with some alcohol. Alcohol helps relax you, so maybe it helped them sleep a little bit too. Um, sleep dead is when a person uh, needs, uh, has sleep that they need to make up. So if you didn't get a good night's sleep last night, the night before, whatever it is, then you owe your body some sleep. And it's like you owe money, but instead of owing money, you owe sleep. And you need to kind of, you need to try to make it up. So if you didn't sleep well on Monday, you didn't sleep well on Tuesday, on Wednesday, Thursday, you know, by the time you get to Thursday, Friday, you are really tired. You feel awful. 
you owe your body a lot of sleep and then you try to make it up. It's hard to make it up all during the weekend. You need to try to make it up a little bit of time. So if you didn't get a good night's sleep last night, maybe you're missing a few hours, try to go a little, to bed a little bit earlier tonight, you know, and get some of that sleep back, you know, and try to catch up. I try to do that, you know, but uh, well, sometimes it's not possible and you have to wait until the weekend. But yes, we do accumulate debt with sleep, just like we do with, uh, with money, okay? Um, this is just a graph that's showing you that sleep varies throughout the lifespan. Um, the orange there and the green together, um, that gives you total sleep. REM sleep is in orange, non-REM sleep is in green. We'll talk about the difference in a moment. But you can see zero years of age, so newborns need to sleep at about, you know, they sleep about 16 hours a day on average, right around there. And then as you get older, the amount of sleep that your body needs decreases. You guys probably, you know, your late teens, um, you know, early 20s, you know, you average, on average, you need about eight hours of sleep or something like that, you know, uh, around there. Maybe a little bit more, but uh, right around there. And as you get older, you don't need as much sleep. You know, when you're like, uh, you know, 70 years old or something like that, uh, 60 years old, you only need about six. You don't need a full eight hours of sleep. Uh, you're 90, even less. Uh, you know, and, and uh, that's why your grandfather seems to wake up so early in the morning. Grandpa may, or grandma might wake up at four in the morning. Why? They don't need that much sleep. The body needs more. You need more sleep when you're younger. Probably has something to do with brain development. Okay, and the way the brain works. We'll talk about those things. But yes, sleep varies throughout the lifespan. Theories of sleep, why do we sleep? Okay, it seems like a big waste of time. Imagine if you didn't have to sleep, right? You can have two full-time jobs or, you know, or maybe three if you didn't go home at all, right? You can just work around the clock, right? You wouldn't wanna do that, right? But it just seems like a big waste of time. Imagine if you didn't have to sleep, you'd have another eight hours or so to your, to your day and you might have fun during that time, maybe get another job or just, you know, or whatever it is. Right, because most of us, you know, you go to work like eight hours, right? You come home, you only have like four hours left until you have to go to bed. Um, you know, and that's the way it is for, for most people. But why do we sleep at all? You know, it just seems like a waste of time, like I said, right? But there are some theories that try to explain, you know, why we sleep. And one theory says that we sleep because it helps us adapt, okay? Adapted function. So within that theory, we have other theories, right? So like restorative theory, Restoration, right? It says that we need sleep to restore our bodies, right? Sleep is needed to conserve energy, right? It helps us conserve energy and to restore our bodies, basically, for us to, to heal properly and just rest from the, you know, the, just from the activities of, of the day, okay? To conserve energy. Here's the thing. If you, uh, if you were to be awake round the clock, if you didn't need to sleep, you would need to consume a lot more calories. You'd need more food. Okay, and for our ancestors in the distant past, right, uh, like thousands of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, you know, food was, uh, was scarce. So the fact that they slept, you know, a large portion of the day meant that they needed less calories. So it helps us adapt, it helps us survive, okay, by conserving that energy, but also restoring the body, helps us rest, helps us basically uh, recover from muscle injuries, from injuries in general, right? Uh, the body needs to rest for you to heal properly and recover properly. So it helps us adapt, okay, to our everyday world, okay? Uh, evolutionary theory is also, you know, part of, a, you know, adapting to the environment. Evolutionary theory says that we evolved sleep, the sleep patterns that we have to avoid predators by sleeping when predators are most active. When are predators most active? At night. Those big cats, right, they hunt at night. Uh, those, uh, animals that actually basically uh, do a lot of killing and eating the carnivores. Uh, they're usually not very active during the day. They're laying around, they sleep during the day, and at night is when they hunt. If you have a cat, right, just a regular domestic cat, they are nocturnal. They're awake at night and, and they're not very active during the day. Now, it, it depends on what time of day, right? But if you see them in the middle of the afternoon, like around noon, one o'clock, you'll see they're usually laying around taking a nap, okay? But at night, when you want to sleep, that's when they're most active. They might sleep a little bit with you, but you'll see that soon after that, they'll run off and they'll be doing something in the house. 
It's probably a good idea for you to close the room. Otherwise, those cats will keep you awake. They'll keep jumping on the bed and keep messing with you um, because they're active at night. And evolutionary theory says that we as human beings have evolved basically to sleep at night so we can stay away from these predators, stay away from these big cats or these other animals that would otherwise hunt and kill us and eat us. And yes, there's these big cats, these predators actually used to hunt our ancestors and eat them. Leopards used to eat us. They used to eat us. Lions and tigers, they used to eat us. Okay? Um, and uh, if we're at night, if we're hiding somewhere asleep, then they can't really find us so easily. They don't, can't really see us that well. So it kept us safe. And that's what the theory says. And that's why we have evolved to be asleep at night because it helps keep us safe. And it still helps keep you safe today, by the way. You should be asleep at night, right? And active during the day. At night, a lot of stuff happens that's dangerous at night, right? Drug deals gone bad, crimes committed, a lot of things happen at night. If you're out there at night, really late at night, and I'm not talking about 10 o'clock or even midnight, but you're out there at two, three in the morning or something like that, that's when some of the bad stuff really happens out there. That's when people get killed, okay? Bad stuff happens you know, at night, because that's when these predators, just like these big cats, come out to do their illegal activities. That's when they try to do them, okay? And it's more dangerous at night. Yeah, yeah sure, you can party and stuff like that, but uh, there's a time when you need to go home and, and be in the safety of your own home, be asleep and not out when those, those things happen. When most people are in bed asleep, that's when those people come out and they do their shady business, so to speak. They do their drug deals or they do their whatever it is that they do. Not all crime is committed at night. Some of it is committed during the day, but let's just say that you're more, you're safer during, you know, uh, uh, if you're in bed at night rather than being out there among, you know, those kind of people. The reason they're out at night is because they're doing stuff that's illegal. Okay, that's when they're trying to do their job. Their illegal job, I should say. Uh, other theories of sleep, uh, cognitive function. Um, this theory basically says that we need sleep in order to function properly, cognitively, right? We need sleep in order to learn, in order to, uh, you know, to form memories, right? You may have noticed that if you are sleep deprived, that it's harder for you to maintain attention, harder for you to focus. And you know what? When you can't maintain attention, when you can't focus, you also can't learn very well. Memory doesn't work very well. We'll have a whole chapter on memory, and you'll see that for one of the stages of uh, memory, um, attention is needed. Without attention, you don't, can't really form any memories that are going to last, okay? Uh, it's harder to make decisions and just harder to remember things in general uh, when you're sleep deprived. We need proper sleep for the brain to function normally, for us to learn and focus and remember things. And there's a lot of research that confirms that. Um, okay, so those were the theories of sleep. Now let's talk about just uh, the stages of sleep. Let's talk about how sleep actually works, how it varies throughout the night. Because there are stages of sleep, okay? So here's the thing. Uh, the brain, remember we learned a little bit about the brain. The brain is, is basically conducting ele you know, uh, electrical activity all the time. The brain is sending electrical signals back and forth, okay? And these electrical signals can be recorded on a computer, okay? Uh, when it's recorded on a computer, that's called, that's called the EEG. Okay, there's a program, right, um, where it, you know, that records the brain waves. Then that's the, the EEG. It stands for electroencephalogram. Electro means it, it records electricity. Uh, encephalo means it has to do with the brain. And gram is just means it's measured. So it measures the brain activity. It, it, so it measures the electrical brain activity, basically. And they have these wires that they basically, uh, on this thing that looks like a helmet, but um, that they, you know, they, they're, try, they're there close to your scalp and they're trying to pick up the electrical signals that are underneath the scalp that, are, that your brain is, is sending. And then that's connected to some machine and then the machine then records those brain patterns, that brain activity. Um, I haven't, uh, this is not my area of expertise, so I haven't really looked into this in a while. Um, I am, you know, I wonder if they can do this wirelessly now you know, where they don't need these wires connected into the machine and it just, uh, you know, communicates with the computer wirelessly, just like the, you know, via the internet. Um, let's talk about these stages of sleep. So from recording the activity in the brain, uh, researchers have found out that the activity isn't always the same, that the brain goes through certain stages when you sleep. And uh, so there's, and there's two kinds of different uh, types of sleep that we get, okay? There's non-REM sleep, 
So it means non-rapid eye movement. It's when we're sleeping and the eyes aren't moving back and forth. And then we have REM sleep. When you are sleeping and your eyes are moving back and forth. Okay, non-REM sleep includes stages one, two, three, and four. And then REM sleep is its own special stage. Uh, a whole sleep cycle is basically the four non-REM stages plus the REM sleep. Okay, so all of those, the non-REM sleep and the REM sleep would make up your whole sleep cycle. Okay, and you usually go through this cycle four or five times a night. You might start at stage one, then go to stage two, three, four, maybe REM sleep, and then you go back, except when you go back, you might start then at stage two and then go to three, four REM sleep, and then you might go back again, but this time you start at three, and it cycles back and forth. And the later it is into the night, the longer you've been asleep, the more time you spend in REM sleep, the quicker it cycles back to REM sleep. And as a lot of you guys know, REM sleep is when, uh, is when people suspect that that's when, that's when dreaming is usually taking place. And we'll talk about how we know that in a moment. Um, so first, let's talk about non-REM sleep, when your eyes are not moving back and forth. Let's talk about, these are the deeper, more restful stages of sleep, okay? So this is when you have, get deeper sleep and you're, you know, it's, you're, it's more restful. Stage one is not deep sleep, of course. Stage one is, uh, is very light sleep. When you, you go to bed and you, you, know, you fall asleep, the first 10 minutes is stage one, okay? The first time you fall asleep, right? If you get up and then you fall back asleep, it's different. You can, you can go into stage two immediately or you can, you know, you go into deeper sleep. But the first time you go to bed, those first 10 minutes when you're actually asleep, that's called light sleep. It's very easy to wake you up during this time, okay? You're just dozing off. You may not even realize that you've fallen asleep. You might think you're still awake, but you've fallen asleep. Very easy to wake from. It's like being very relaxed. You know, it's like when you're there resting and, uh, and then somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you still awake? And they say, yeah, 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 I'm awake. And it, it startles you. Uh, and uh, you actually had fallen asleep already and you didn't even know it. You were in stage one. But yes, you had fallen asleep, but you can easily respond. It's very easy to wake you up if somebody should talk to you. Um, and then we need to know about the kind of brain waves that are generated uh, you know, during this time. So during stage one, you get these things called alpha waves. They are low frequency waves. So they're, they're basically uh, waves. Uh, that have 8 to 13 hertz, okay? I'll show you some um, images in a moment, but um, they're, uh, they're the waves, you know, the alpha waves that show up during stage one are called alpha waves, okay? Uh, they're not the slowest waves, but they are low frequency. Later, you'll get theta waves that are even lower frequency. Theta waves are even slower, okay? Four to seven hertz. The higher the hertz, the higher the number, that means the more cycles that you have per second, the faster the wave. So, so the lower the number, the slower the wave, usually that indicates uh, you know, basically uh, deeper sleep. But during stage one, that's light sleep, you get some alpha waves, right? And, and then you get some theta waves later on, right? As you get deeper into sleep, but you're still in stage one. And then you enter stage two, which is deeper sleep, right? When the body's in deep relaxation. When you're in stage two, you're in deep relaxation, okay? You get mostly theta waves. You get mostly those slower waves. You get these things called sleep spindles. You can see the image there. A sleep spindle is a, it looks like very tight waves, very like a brief burst of activity. So a faster wave would have more energy, uh, would be more scrunched together like that, okay? You know, taller and also kind of more scrunched together. That's uh, indicative of more activity. So you can see the sleep spindle there, right? Um, that's a brief burst of activity uh, that only lasts a few seconds. Um, researchers aren't really sure what it does, but one hypothesis is that it might be related to learning and memory. It might be the brain trying to basically form those memories. That's the hypothesis. You also get these things during stage two called a K-complex. And you see the image there, a K-complex. It's a big spike in electrical activity, a big tall wave very high and then very, it goes up very high and then goes down very low. A K-complex, right? Very high amplitude wave. It may be in response to environmental stimuli. See, because in stage two, you're asleep, it's deeper sleep. It's harder to wake you up during this stage. And sometimes when you're asleep, maybe somebody slams a door or shuts a door. They don't have to slam, but maybe they shut a door and it makes a sound. If you were in stage one, that would have woken you up. But in stage two, you do not wake up 
and instead there's this spike in activity, right, called the K-complex, which means that your brain responded, but you didn't wake up, and it just goes back to, you know, the normal uh, kind of theta waves there. So that's, that may be what's happening with a K-complex, but again, that's, that's kind of a guess of what's going on, okay? Um, that we're looking at these waves and trying to figure out what's happening. But remember that, well, we don't really know. The person's asleep. Okay, stage three is deep sleep. And when you get to stage three, you're in deeper sleep. You get these things called delta waves. Delta waves are even slower. They only go up to four hertz. So they're less than four hertz, right? Up to four hertz. Okay, so they're the slowest, largest waves. Okay, so remember, it's alpha, beta, you know, uh, theta, delta right? There was no beta waves, but there's alpha waves, theta waves, and delta waves. Delta, delta waves are the slowest ones, and they show up during stage three. So you're in deep sleep during stage three. Your heart rate, your respiration, your breathing basically, are, 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 they slow dramatically. They really slow down. Okay, so it's deep sleep. And then you enter stage four. That's the deepest sleep. In stage four, you only get delta waves, okay? The slowest waves. It's hardest, it's the hardest to wake up from, you know, during uh, stage four. During stage four, if you're in stage four, if somebody wants to wake you up, I mean, it's not enough for them to talk to you, yell at you, they have to get you and they have to shake you, hey, wake up, you know, it's really hard. Uh, you know, they may even have, you know, I don't suggest that they do this, but you know, you might have to, you know, like really shake the person or, 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 or kick them or something or smack them and hey, wake up, it's really hard to wake them up. Okay, as a matter of fact, I have a story about, you know, when I was a kid and I, I fell asleep and I used to share a room with my brother and I locked my brother out because I used to go to bed earlier and they were banging on the door, you know, yelling at me, hey, wake up, open the door, you idiot. And they were yelling at me and they, they couldn't wake me up. Finally, they, you know, they got in through the window, you know, and, you know, had to break into the house basically uh, and, uh, and, you know, in order to unlock the door. And my brother says that he claims that he basically, he kicked me, you idiot, why the hell didn't you open the door? And he says, I, you know, he claims that he kicked me. And I don't remember, I didn't even wake up. That's what stage four is like. It's very hard to wake up during stage four. Um, stage four is also important because that's when growth hormone is released from the pituitary gland, right? Growth hormone helps your body grow, to grow those muscles, those bones, right? Remember, uh, I don't, actually, I didn't say this before, a different class, but, um, Infants grow very fast and infants sleep a lot and they need to get proper sleep because that's when growth hormone is released. If you are not sleeping properly, you're also probably not growing properly if you're an infant, okay? But if you're a bodybuilder and you want to build those, you know, big muscles, it's a good idea to get a good night's sleep. That's when those growth hormones are released. Sleepwalking and sleep talking, about 20% of the time, they happen in stage four. They don't always happen during stage four, but... Uh, you know, about 20% of the time they happen there. We'll talk about what sleepwalking and sleep talking is in a bit, but you are, I mean, it's self-explanatory. You know what that is. Uh, night terrors are, it's, are basically, uh, it's like when you have a very bad dream, but it's, it happens during stage four. When you have a night terror, the person wakes up with extreme fear and screams or may run without really waking fully. Here's the thing about a night terror. It is not exactly like a bad dream because bad dreams happen during REM sleep, which we'll talk about in a moment, nightmares. A night terror is different. A night terror is like, you it's, it's like when you have a panic attack, but you're asleep and you wake up screaming, thinking that somebody's trying to kill you and you may run around without really waking up fully. Or maybe you do wake up and, when people, and maybe you wake up screaming and then your spouse or your brother or friend, whatever, say, hey, what, what's happening? What's happening? And then they finally, they wake you up and say, and you, what you're going to say is like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell was going on. You just don't know. You, it's like you had a panic attack during sleep. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's, that's called the night terror. It's like a bad dream, except you don't remember anything. It wasn't really a dream. It was more like a panic attack. I think of it more like a panic attack when you're asleep. I know because I've had one before and that's the way it seemed like to me. You know, I didn't, you know, the, I didn't remember a damn thing about it because you're not really dreaming when you have a night terror, okay? Uh, and then there's REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement, okay? Um, it, because when you enter REM sleep, your eyes are moving back and forth 
under those closed eyelids. Your, eyelid, your eyelids are closed, you're asleep, but your eyes are moving back and forth and you can see the little indentation there under the, uh, in the eyelid, you can see them moving back and forth, okay? Dreaming usually occurs during REM sleep. How do we know this? Because they've done sleep studies. They've done studies where the participants were really all they have to do is sleep and they have them sleep and they have like wires connected to them or maybe not, but they have them sleep and then they wait for their eyes to start moving back and forth and their eyes start moving back and forth and then they wake them up and they ask them what was happening and participants will almost always say that they were dreaming. That's when dreaming seems to occur during REM sleep. It's also called paradoxical sleep because there's a lot of brain activity during REM sleep. You're dreaming, your brain is active, but you can't move your muscles. You can't move your body because, well, you're not supposed to move your body when you're dreaming. You're not, if you're dreaming that someone's chasing you, right? You shouldn't really be running around, okay? So you, your brain is active and you're dreaming that you're running around, but you're not running around. Your body is actually partly paralyzed. You can't move your muscles. And that is important, okay? So you do not act out the, your dreams and hurt yourself. So there's high brain activity, but you can't really move. REM sleep seems to last longer later in the sleep period. It's, it lasts longer as you get deeper into the night, just before awaking, okay? Um, and if you have a nightmare, that's a bad dream that happens during REM sleep, okay? When you have a nightmare, it's different than a nightmare. When you have a nightmare, you have a bad dream. Sometimes it's so bad, that you wake up scared, basically. It wakes you up, it's so frightening. Or if somebody wakes you up when you're having that bad dream because you can, you know, they can, they can, you know, they can see you there and, and, and you're starting to make some sounds and you're freaking out and, and you're asleep and they may wake you up, you know, just so you can, st so you can stop the bad dream and, and then they'll ask you what was happening. They'll you'll say, I was having a bad dream, I was having a nightmare. And you'll remember, you'll be able to remember it. You'll be able to remember, say, oh yeah, I dreamt that I, you know, that there was this monster that was chasing me and, uh, and I thought he was gonna kill me and eat me. And you'll be able to remember it, okay? When you just wake up from it, right when you wake up, you'll be able to remember it. Not like a night terror. Night terror, you don't remember anything because you weren't really dreaming. With a nightmare, you do. Uh, dreaming in general happens during REM sleep and you, uh, you don't always remember your dream. If you, want, if you want to remember your dreams, well, you need to remember right, after the dream or during the dream you remember and then you remember it right after but then the memory very quickly fades even a nightmare the memory fades very quickly if you do not think about it if you do don't tell somebody about it if you don't write it down you will not remember it later on if you just wake up from a bad dream and you're scared right you may think about it you may remember it later but if you just wake up feeling scared and then you go back to sleep right away you'll forget the dream very easily. Or maybe you don't even wake from your nightmare, let's say. And you just go in and then you start another dream, right? You won't even remember it the next day. We don't remember most of the dreams, most of our dreams. We all dream, but we don't always remember because they, the memory of the dream fades very easily, very quickly. The body does that normally. The brain does that. You're supposed to forget them, okay? Here's what the um, you know, sleep stages look like, uh, the brain activity. You can see when you're awake, the, 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 it's very, at the top there, the, the wave is very tight, indicating more activity. They're a little bit, uh, the, it's a little bit taller. Stage one, you can see the, there's less, less activity, but you can still see some little spikes there. Stage two, right, uh, you can see some sleep spindles there, right? Stage, look at stage three and four. Look at how spread out the waves are. They're more spread out. That indicates it's slower, there's less brain activity. In the REM sleep, it's a li they're a little, not quite like when you're awake, but a little bit tighter, more brain activity when, you're, when you undergo REM sleep, usually indicative of, uh, of dreaming. All right, let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about theories of dreaming. Why do we dream? Not why do we sleep? We already talked about that, but why do we dream? Okay, now the most popular theory of dreaming is Freud's theory of, of dreams. Uh, Freud believed that dreams basically represent unconscious wishes. That uh, we dream about things that are kind of unresolved issues, dreams are meaningful, and a lot of things that we dream about, it's like wishes that we have, we have a wish. Like for instance, if you're sexually aroused and you really wanna have sex with someone, right? Uh, you'll probably dream that you're having sex with them. It's a wish that you have according to Freud. Or if you dream that there's some monster chasing you and you're afraid, it's not, like, it's not that you wish for the monster to chase you. 
But the wish is that you want to run away from something that scares you. That's what you're wishing for. That's what Freud said. And to tell you a little bit more about this, Freud said that dreams have two types of meaning. They have uh, dreams, uh, two types of content. Uh, dreams have what he called manifest content, right? That is the surface content, right? That is actually what you see in the dream. So if you dream about a monster ch chasing you, there's a monster is chasing you, you're running, right? The monster is green or whatever it is. That's the manifest content. That's the surface content. That is what you actually see in the dream, okay? And then the latent content, latent means hidden. That's the hidden content. That is the symbolic meaning of the dream. What does the dream actually represent? What is the hidden wish or the desire? If you dream about a monster chasing you, right? The monster, you running is the manifest content. And then the latent content, the hidden meaning of the dream would be, uh, that's the latent content. You would have to think about, okay, what does that monster represent? What am I really trying to run away from? What is it that really scares me? That monster might represent your job. It might represent school or it's something you're really afraid of. And your wish is to run away from it. That's what you desire, according to Freud. So Freud's have the surface meaning, manifest content, and then they have a symbolic meaning, the latent content, okay? Um, another theory says that dreams are just, it's just information processing. That uh, the brain basically processes a lot of information and tries to strengthen it in memory while we dream, okay? So when we're dreaming, it's basically just the brain trying to strengthen those memories, trying to basically help you learn things. So, you know, we know that sleep deprivation is bad for memory, right? But dreams are an important way to process information according to this theory. And we, tend, we do tend to dream about things that, you know, that uh, we're concerned about. You know, like if you have a new job, you might dream about your job and about the things that you do during the, your job. According to this theory, that's just your brain basically trying to process the information, trying to strengthen those connections in memory and that'll help you actually get better at your job. It'll help you form those memories that'll help you do your job. Okay, that's what the theory says, that dreams are a way for our brain to process information. And, and it basically, we try to make sense of that information and it shows up in dreams. Dreams as neuroactivity. Uh, this theory, the last theory is the, less, the least interesting one. It, the, uh, last, this theory here, the third theory, right? Dreams as neuroactivity says that dreams are meaningless and they represent random neuroactivity. It basically says that the brain is always active and the brain is sending signals back and forth even when we're sleeping. And that the higher areas of the brain try to make sense of these random signals that are being sent back and forth that have nothing to do with reality because you're asleep. The higher brain areas try to make sense of it and that's, that's why you get a dream. That's the resulting dream that you get. But it has nothing to do uh, with anything meaningful. That's what that theory says. Those are the three theories of dreams. Uh, let's continue and let's talk about uh, sleep problems, okay? Now, people can also have uh, uh, sleep problems. We mentioned some of these already, but here are, there's a whole bunch of them. Here's a list of them that I'll, I'll go through very quickly. They're not hard to understand. Uh, we talked about some of them already. Insomnia, you've all probably heard of that. That's when you have difficulty sleeping. There's different kinds of it. You might have what's called onset insomnia. You have trouble falling asleep, or you might have maintenance insomnia where you have trouble staying asleep. So you fall asleep, that's not really a problem, but then you wake up and then you can't fall back asleep. That's maintenance and insomnia, okay? And there's also somnambulism, that's when you sleepwalk. Whenever you see the word som, by the way, that means it has to do with sleep, insomnia, right? You can't sleep. Somnambulism, som means sleep, ambulism has to do with walking. So sleepwalking is somnambulism. Somniloquy, right? Psalm means sleep, loqui means that's to do with words. So that's sleep talking. It can occur in any, any stage, but you know, 20% of the time it happens during stage four. Night terrors is a really frightening dream during the early night. I wouldn't even call it a dream. It's more of a panic attack, okay? You wake up in a panic, your heart rate, uh, breathing are elevated. I mean, you're freaking out. It's, it's, I think it's just a panic attack that you have when you're asleep. Not really a dream, you don't remember anything. Nightmares, nightmares are different. Nightmare is a very, very, very vivid uh, sleep terror during REM sleep. So a nightmare is just a really bad dream that you have during REM sleep. And when you do wake up from a nightmare, you remember what was happening. You remember how you feel scared still. I mean, you remember how you feel, you remember what was happening. 
you can describe it, but then you can easily forget it, okay? If you do not describe it, if you don't talk about it, if you don't write it down, you can easily forget it. Narcolepsy is just when you have excessive sleepiness. Narcolepsy is when you fall asleep very quickly. Not very quickly, you fall asleep very suddenly, excessive sleepiness, okay? So you may be there in class, right? Uh, and then you're, you'll just fall asleep suddenly and your head will just drop and hit the desk. Or you're at work and you'll just fall to the floor asleep, right? That's narcolepsy, that's a sleep problem uh, that happens in some people. It actually occurs in dogs as well. And they're often triggered by things you wouldn't think would trigger them, but they're often triggered by things that, that are exciting. Like I saw a video, I'm not gonna show you guys the video because it doesn't really work in Zoom, but, uh, um, or at least it gives me problems, but uh, with the sound, uh, I saw a video of a dog that had narcolepsy. So the owner gets a bowl, of, gets a bowl basically put, pours some food in the bowl and puts it there for the dog. The dog gets so happy, starts wagging its tail and starts running toward the bowl and then just falls asleep before it gets to the bowl, just drops, you know, it looks like it drops dead. That's narcolepsy, right? Sleep apnea is when you have difficulty breathing when you sleep and you must re-awaken wake to breathe. Very common in people who, have, uh, who are obese, uh, they'll, you know, they'll stop sleeping. I mean, they'll stop breathing when they're asleep and then they wake up gasping for air. It also happens in people who are not obese, it, but, it, but it's, a, it's a frequent symptom of, a, of, of, of obesity, okay? Um, that's sleep apnea. You stop breathing when you sleep and then you must reawaken to sleep. So you, you're gonna feel like you're, like you're dying, okay? Like you're running out of air. REM sleep behavior disorder, that's more interesting. REM sleep behavior disorder or RBD for abbreviation is when you tend to act out your dreams. And that's a sleep disorder, it's a sleep problem. It leads to problems where people injure themselves or they may even uh, injure the people that are sleeping next to them because they act out their dreams. Just like this little uh, comic here shows you, right? Um, this is uh, from the comic uh, Calvin and Hobbes, which is, is old, it's old. I used to read these when I was a kid. I actually have books, of uh, a bunch of comics of this, but uh, you know, the, basically there's a little boy and he has a stuffed animal, a, 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 a tiger, a stuffed, it's a stuffed animal. But to the boy, the tiger is alive. When the parents show up, the tiger is just a stuffed animal. But when the parents leave, the tiger comes to life. It's a, like an imaginary friend, okay? But it's, it's, it's a stuffed animal. And the tiger wakes up, right? Sleeps next to the boy, so he wakes up. He say, what a peculiar dream I had last night. I, I, I dreamed that I was in a fight, in a big fight with a ferocious weasel. And he turns to the boy and he says, what do you suppose it means? And then the boy wakes up and he's all beat up, right? Because the tiger was acting out his dreams. And the boy says, it means you're sleeping on the floor tonight, you nin nincompoop. So the tiger has basically been acting out the, the dreams, right? It's like uh, RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder, right? And that's what happens when you have this disorder. You act out your dreams. And if you have bad dreams, you may punch and kick and bite people. And you can injure yourself and others. Or you can wake up, or not wake up, but you can maybe run around and, 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 and you know, run into a wall or, or basically uh, you know, fall through the window or something like that. It's dangerous. Okay, but that's REM, uh, sleep behavior disorder. Uh, the next part, uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, there's something known as sudden infant death syndrome that you guys need to know about. Uh, just something related to infants. It's experts suggest that you need to put your infants to sleep on their backs. Okay, not on their side, not on their bellies because they can more easily suffocate. Um, sudden infant death syndrome is something that basically where an infant a newborn will uh, suddenly stop breathing during the night when they're sleeping and they'll die. Sometimes they suffocate because they ended up on their bellies and they can't pick their neck up, they can't pick their head up for long periods of time and they'll suffocate. Or if there's too many toys or, or, or warm blankets in there, they can suffocate. It's recommended that you put them to sleep on their back. If it's cold, they can have some warm pajamas, but you don't need to put blankets over them because they can suffocate. But sometimes, you can do everything right and they sleep on their back and, and, and you know, there's nothing suffocating them and they can still stop breathing and die. It's kind of mysterious as to why that happens. But some of it is explained because they suffocate, but sometimes they just die all of a sudden, they stop breathing. Infants younger than 12 months uh, um, and boys are actually at higher risk. It happens more often in boys than girls. But when they're younger, they're 12 months, they're more at risk for this. Actually, they're, most, they're more at risk uh, when they're seven months or younger. And the reason I think that is, is because at seven months, infants acquire an ability usually 
uh, that prevents uh, sudden infant death syndrome, prevents at least, at least prevents them from suffocating. When they get to be about seven months of age, that's when they can roll over. They can roll on their belly. They can roll back on their back. They can roll around back and forth. Before that, they can't really do that. So if they end up on their belly, let's say they roll over, but they can't roll back, um, they can suffocate. But there's other risk factors. If they're born prematurely, they're more likely to stop breathing and die because their lungs are not fully formed. Uh, if they're smoking within that home, that secondhand smoke is, is, uh, is harmful, right? Hyperthermia, which means that they, if they overheat, they can stop breathing and die as well. And sometimes parents will overheat their children, right? They think it's fall, because it more likely happens during the fall as well. They think it's getting colder and they'll bundle them up really well and they can overheat their infants. How do you know if your baby is cold? Well, if you feel cold, then they're probably cold too, right? If they have similar clothing or, you know, you know whatever clothing and stuff. Uh, if you are not cold, they're probably not cold either. You have to think about that, okay? Don't think that you need to bundle them up when it's not that cold just because it's a little fresh or something like that. But it's a very horrible thing that happens to some people where your infant suddenly dies. It's devastating. It's recommended that you put your infants to sleep on their back. Don't put any stuffed animals in there or fuzzy blankets. Put them on their backs in pajamas if they need, you know, you know warm pajamas, it's something warm, right? If they need to be warm. But that will cut down on the risk of them dying suddenly, of them suddenly stopping to breathe during the night. Okay, the next part is about drugs, which we'll talk about next time. So I will uh, stop recording now.